I'm very excited to introduce my guest for this special episode of Hangouts with Hello Sunday Morning. Uh, most people know Sean McAuliffe as a, as a comedian, writer, and an actor, uh, but less well known is the fact that he's chosen not to drink since his early 20s. Uh, Sean is presenter of the new three-part ABC co- uh, documentary, Sean McAuliffe's On The Source, uh, where he takes a close look at the uh, Australian drinking culture. So uh, welcome, Sean. Thank you for, for joining well, us today. Thank you, Andy. Very nice to be here. And uh, um, yeah, I hope, uh, I hope everybody uh, enjoys the documentary series. It's a strange time to have something like this on television because uh, so much of it is, uh, has me in social situations. We recorded it um, between September and December last year when, of course, the COVID-19 crisis wasn't an issue. Uh, it didn't, we would never think of such a thing happening. Uh, so a lot of the documentary uh, footage is of me with vast numbers of people having <laughs> parties and getting together. And maybe people will watch it just for that because I can't remember what that's like. So do you just want to tell us a little bit about the documentary and also kind of your, I guess, your motivations for wanting to create the program in the first place? Okay. Well, I, as you said, I uh, gave up drinking... Uh, a long time ago. And the reason I gave it up, I suppose it would be fair to say that maybe I was, um, I overindulged um, when I was at university. I was introduced to drinking when I was 18. I didn't uh, drink beforehand and we didn't have it in the house. Mum and dad didn't drink at all. And so it wasn't really discussed. And I, I would have probably got my main impression of what alcohol was and what its purposes were from watching television or watching comedy films or, you know, so I, I kind of just treated it as a bit of another thing, you know, not you can consider. But at university, you know, that was what you did. And uh, in a rather unthinking way, I, I took to it uh, as a way of, I think, overcoming my, uh, my own shyness uh, in social situations. I was uh, obviously at university, I was meeting a whole bunch of new people. Um, uh, that was challenging for somebody like me who was a bit shy. And uh, as for many people, I'm sure alcohol is a great way of just sort of overcoming that, um, that reticence that you might have when you're meeting new people. Mm. Um, but it was a bit of a waste of time. I wasn't much of a, I didn't do it very well, Andy. I couldn't, <laughs> it was two or three drinks and I'd kind of be pretty merry. And while I don't think, <laughs> I mean, we all think this when we're drunk, that we're, that we're <laughs> charming, I suppose, or we're funny or <laughs> I don't know whether that's so, but it kind of makes everything all right in, in that mild way but um yeah i it didn't really work out for me so i i decided just to stop and it wasn't it was as easy as that i just thought well i'm kind of wasting my time here i'll um, um i'll just not have it anymore and probably not not it wasn't the next day but certainly over the period of probably about six months it kind of yeah. just just went away yeah um so i never really thought about it at all apart from thinking to myself i this is not a good idea. I don't think I really ever addressed my mind to alcohol or its place or what it was for or how it could be used or whether it was a food or anything like that at all. Yeah. So we fast forward um, a few decades and I have children of my own. And um, um, while uh, certainly my wife uh, enjoys a glass of wine um, and alcohol uh, in moderation occasionally, uh, I uh, had really no advice I could give to my children about the prospect of being offered alcohol and what you know they might like to think about yeah so uh yeah other than don't don't bother with it i think would have been my advice which i appreciate would have been completely unhelpful and useless because yeah. um, obviously people get curious when they're young and, and yeah. kind of are approaching adulthood yeah. so really that's that was the motivation for the documentary i thought well this is interesting i i went through a similar process with uh, faith and religion where i i'm kind of I was curious to know about what people, how people um, came to the decision to worship a God or put their faith in an afterlife, that sort of thing. And I went out and met some people and made some documentary um, uh, series about that. And I thought I'd do the same thing with alcohol, basically um, talking to people, not in an interview setting, because I think people, uh, you know, if, if you expect people to come into a studio and talk to you, it all becomes very formal. So I wanted to go into their world. Yeah, and um, I see, I see that uh, alcohol is such an all-pervasive part of life that it is very difficult to think of a situation where it's not part of it 
anything, you know, whether you're commiserating or celebrating or yep. uh, the birth of a child or the death of a relative or a friend, you know, it's, there's nothing that, that doesn't invite uh, the participation of alcohol to some extent. Yeah. Um, and that could be a good thing. That's a good thing. I didn't want to go into this uh, and make a documentary series that was all gloom and doom. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to be have an open mind, be non-judgmental, and and if there was good, let's hear about the good. If there was bad, let's hear about the bad. Yeah. Uh, and so, the hopeful takeaway. Sorry, Annika, I keep going on, but the hopeful takeaway at the end of it for me was that people would be um, better informed and, and may even be uh, in a situation where, like me, they were going, "Oh, I never thought about that. I'll ask a question and I'll find out something more about it before I decide to continue." with my drinking uh, as I do or take it up if yeah. people don't drink. Yeah. So what, uh, I mean, you've, you kind of uh, delved into certain areas of, uh, of society and, you know, drinking in, in, in Australia is such a normal kind of part of society. It's completely normalised. What kind of parts of the culture do you think we get right and what part of drinking culture do you think we get wrong? Well, in the very first episode, I went to, I really, I really went in uh, boots and all because we went to a B&S ball. Yeah. And yeah. I'd never been to a B&S ball, although I, I'd heard about B&S balls and I heard yeah. they were, you know, it was pretty excessive. And I guess that was what was attractive is that uh, um, to the documentary filmmakers that we were, that we thought, well, we might see something uh, that either explodes the myth about B&S balls or confirms what we all suspected. Yeah. Um, so what, what was interesting, I mean, certainly the shape of it was pretty much how I, how I thought it was going to be. Uh, I think what was surprising was, as an older man, I think meeting younger people and talking to them, you know, people who, there were people there who, like me at 18, it was going to be their first time drinking. Yeah. And I thought to myself, wow, is this the, is this the best way to be introduced to yeah. this substance? Because obviously the, um, the assumption is that you will drink too much of it. Yeah. But what I did learn in the course of spending a couple of days up there and certainly spending all day with those attending the BNS ball was that everybody had each other's back. Yeah. Uh, that the, They were all very, very conscious uh, of the serious consequences of excess mm. and were going to make sure that their friends didn't get into trouble. Uh, I can't say that when I was that age at university that that would have been at the forefront of everybody's mind. Yeah. I think... I think you're you're going to be on your own, and you're going to be perhaps if you if you indulged too much, you were going to be a spectacle, and people were looking forward to that. So it seemed a lot more positive to me, I, I must say, that than what I was expecting. Um, and uh, we were fortunate enough to speak to a couple of guys who were very frank about their own experiences with alcohol, leaving aside the BNS ball, that there had been some problems, there had been some depression, uh, that alcohol had been used to ameliorate the immediate effects of, the, of what was happening in their lives and they had come to terms with the consequences that would be a bit serious and again they were there to help each other so that yeah. that is that that was the takeaway from the um, from the bns ball for me and that might be a country thing too i think um i think yeah. everybody's um, one of the things about alcohol is that you can have a pleasant shared experience with people but also the other thing is that in life we're all trying to connect with each other and experience that shared experience where we're yeah. all trying to connect with, 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 with people. And I guess, um, uh, yeah, alcohol, because it's there, uh, it can, um, I, I don't want to use the word reductive. I sometimes use the word reductive, but it is a bit, it kind of elevates or lowers people to the same level. You know, yeah. it's very hard to put on airs and be better than anybody else when you're all as bad as each other. <laughs> I, guess, I guess I'm just talking about drunkenness here. I'm not actually talking about just drinking because I appreciate there's a difference between drinking and getting drunk. Yeah. yeah. In fact, it's quite an interesting expression, getting drunk, because you become, you become all consumed with it. You know, it, you, 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 go from the, you go from the verb to, um, to the state. You, I am drunk. I have become the thing that has been consumed. You know, it's a, yeah. Psychologically, it's quite interesting. Yeah. So what I mean, the, the, the premise of the, the, the documentary is uh, understanding culture and then taking that out and giving thinking about how you can talk to your own kids around this. And I'm kind of in a similar situation in the way that I, a slightly different background that I probably changed my relationship with alcohol 
probably about three or four years ago, but now I've got an 18, a 16, a 14 year old and an 11 year old all being exposed to alcohol in some way, shape or form and all kind of being kind of intrigued about it in some way, shape or form, either mm. by testing it or... So what's the kind of the take out for you in terms of the advice that you would give to your kids, given that you haven't drunk for a long time, but they are kind of moving into that environment now? Yeah. Yeah, well, I, it, it's, I guess it's whatever advice as parents we can give to our children, we have to be also conscious of the fact that boiling it down to an abstract notion is not the whole process of the advice. You know, uh, yeah. there'll be that curiosity about what it is. And also, you only really know where the wall is when you run into it or when you felt it, you know, when you yeah. bang into it. Um, yeah. You can explain the wall as a parent, you can say there's a wall there and you, you, you're going to hit your head on it if you yeah. run at it too fast. So, you know, just take it, take it easy. But the wall is in a different place for everybody. Yeah. Uh, and um, you, are, you do, to a certain extent, have to experience the line that you've crossed before you know you've gone too far. Yeah. But I think you can, you can be um, well armed with um, information. Yeah. So that you sort of know what to expect. Yeah. Um, as much as you, as much as any eighteen-year-old can. Yeah. Or, um, or you know, let's let's face it, people are probably drinking younger than that. But let's assume for a moment it's eighteen. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, and you know, one of the ro one of the roles of government, I think, is to is to keep us safe, and whether that's from an outside force or from ourselves, sometimes with poor decisions. So the labelling is really important, I think, for alcohol and. Yeah. My own personal view is that we might have a bit of a way to go before uh, that is truly satisfactory. Yeah. Because yeah. And I know I keep, I keep saying this whenever I'm asked about this documentary series, and they say, what's the thing you learned most of all? Yeah. Uh, and that really surprised you. And it really was that alcohol is a class one carcinogen. Yeah. It is, it is some, something that really needs, that people really need to know that. And, and I, I went to a book club in one of the episodes, you know, uh, and um, and all the women there were very con they all they all enjoyed a drink and they were all very conscious of the effect that it was having on their health. But none of them realised the uh, very significant link between drinking alcohol and and increasing the likelihood of breast cancer. Yeah, you know, it's a very they were kind of not only surprised but a little bit appalled and I think a bit worried. Yeah. Um, so that's, uh, that's interesting that that's not as well known. Uh, and as good as and helpful as organisations like Drinkwise are, we have to remember that that is a, an organisation that's been put together by alcohol uh, retailers and uh, manufacturers, you know, yeah. and it's, it's right and proper that, uh, that uh, they um, indicate what... Uh, they regard the, sh uh, the shortfalls of their own product, certainly, but we, we all, I don't think a lot of people are aware that maybe drink wise has kind of got a foot in both camps. You know, they kind of well, still want you to, they still want you to buy the alcohol yeah. uh, from them. Uh, but I, uh, you know, so we need something else as well as drink wise. We need a lot of, a lot of portals for information and uh, hello Sunday morning is a, is a, is a good example of that. It's one of the reasons why I'm talking to you today. Yeah. Yeah, and and you also, I mean, I guess there's, I think there's a lot of parallels between alcohol and where the journey that the society's on at the moment and tobacco and where that was probably, the, you know, 40, 50 years ago. You yeah. know, a huge amount of uh, people smoking at those days and didn't really understand the kind of risks to it. And, you know, the, the industry had a vested interest to keep people confused about the issue so that they'd carry on doing it in a way. And I think, you know, we're kind of in that, I don't know if it's exactly the same, but we're not far away from that at the moment. It is, as you said, if you look at the information, it's a class one carcinogen. Yeah. Uh, and, and society needs to understand that. I don't think society quite knows that either yet. So this is kind of an interesting time from that perspective, I think. It is, and, and tobacco is, a, is a, it's a, it, it's an irresistible parallel to try and seek out. I think there are a couple of differences that do make it its own thing because um, certainly the industry, the tobacco industry certainly conspired to hide information. Yes. Um, I don't think that's happening with alcohol. I think alcohol has been around a, a lot longer and it was more accessible and it's more pervasive. There are more people who drink than would have ever smoked as a percentage of the, of the society that we're living in. Mm. 
Um, but yes, you're right. I think it is in the interests of the alcohol industry to not volunteer um, as much information as maybe we should have at our, hand, at our disposal. But that's on us too. I mean, I think we, we owe it to ourselves to seek it out and it's readily available. Yeah. Um, so if this might this documentary series might be a conversation starter or, yeah. or a, a journey into query, you know, which is not a bad thing to do. The other thing with tobacco is is that if you if you have five cigarettes, the fifth cigarette doesn't get you drunk. I mean, you're not you're not going to get in the car and drive uh, into a wall, you know, and hurt yourself or maybe other people. You're only going to hurt yourself. Leave aside passive smoking for a moment. You're only going to. It, it, it is a bit different. I mean, you can get addicted to nicotine as much as you can get addicted to, to alcohol, and there can be psychological factors there as well. But it's the it's the muddying of the way your prefrontal cortex works yeah. that makes it such a significant difference, significantly different between alcohol and tobacco. Yeah. But as we've seen, I would say probably tobacco is the is the lesser threat to your health, and we see how we treat it now. And I wonder whether labeling on, on alcohol may well turn towards, uh, you know, tobacco and say, well, it's probably not a bad idea to have, as they have now, a silhouette of a pregnant woman with a line through it and maybe a little bit of text. I'm not sure what exists now, but I think there was some talk of having text saying uh, any alcohol uh, will impair the, the function of your child. And, and yeah, there's a big push for that at the moment. So yeah. there's an organisation called FAIR that are leading that at the moment. And I think it's actually with the ministers to make that decision. So I think the, the decision around labelling around pregnancies is imminent. So I think there's a lot of activity going on at the moment. So that will be a good kind of leap forward, I think, if that kind of goes forward. Yeah, we've got that. I think that certainly the symbol is there. And it's certainly yeah. maybe it's on certain sized bottles and maybe not yeah. on everything. Yeah. Uh, but the... Yes, when we were making the documentary, I was conscious of the fact that the text was being discussed, and I can't remember the exact wording that was being yeah. put forward um, by those concerned about the health implications and what was being pushed back by the, the industry. But I don't think the industry, the industry is quite happy to have a warning on it, but I think they felt that, in fact, rather disingenuously, I think it was suggested by somebody from the alcohol lobby that uh, if people were interested, they could Google it. <laughs> but that's, yeah. not some, that's not something... That's the whole purpose of labelling is that you, you try and get as much of the information as possible off the back yeah. of that, yeah, back yeah. of that packaging. Rather, than, I mean, people aren't going to go. Well, before I pour my uh, <laughs> my, my lemon, lime, and bitters and my my, my scotch and soda, or whatever, I'm just going to Google it. So uh, the other thing is, I suppose it takes up space on the label, and I think by law or by regulation, the text has to be a certain size depending on how big the label is. Yeah, that's right. So I think what we'll see is, and it'll be very interesting, Andy, to see whether this happens, is that we might see bottles with two labels on them. One, the front one, which is all pretty and suggesting of a great tradition and that sort of thing, which is, is, yeah. is how the product is sold. And on the back, quite separate, so it doesn't go all the way around, is another label, which could have a lot more information on it, but probably in a smaller font. Yeah. Agree, agree. Now, you just, just uh, you in your show as well um, had a drink. Uh, how, was, how was that for you? Well, I was very conscious of trying to not make it look like a joke. And yeah. that's difficult for, difficult for me from the starting position because uh, of the fact that I'm a comedian. Yeah. Um, but we always had a little bit of a rule in our house when uh, the kids were growing up that we wouldn't laugh about... Um, drunkenness and I yeah. think the reason for that was pretty clearly because my sister-in-law uh, uh, was uh, suffering from alcoholism and uh, we could see that there were some you know pretty unfunny consequences as a result yeah. of that sort of excess so well, without visiting that gloom and doom on the children I think we just sort of didn't find it as funny so therefore we, we never sold that message so when we were discussing the possibility that I might um, have a few drinks and then do an MRI and sit some tests and see, you know, what was lost as a result of uh, succeeding drinks. Yeah. Uh, I was conscious of, of treating it seriously and making sure that people were aware it was done under medical supervision. Yeah. It didn't look like a fun thing. So I, I said, look, I tell you what, let's make the, 
let's make the substance look as unappealing as possible. So I think I picked vodka and we mixed it with ginger ale. So not only did it look oh, terrible, gosh. it tasted appalling. <laughs> um, the other thing I said, I said, I don't want it in a glass, put it in a beaker, make it look like a medical, what it is. Let's yeah. just reduce it to its basic terms. So again, yeah. that didn't look sexy and funny yeah. or pleasant either. And we made sure it was in the environs of the of Swinburne, the uh, pharma psychology uh, section as well. So yeah, we took yeah. any took any potential fun out of it. Yeah. Um, having said that, I was concerned that, not that I'd get a taste for it and think it was a great thing, uh, but I just didn't want to look too foolish, I suppose, on camera. Uh, and uh, I think, mind you, that, would have been a, that wouldn't have been a bad thing either. We'd just go for honesty and see what happened. So the idea was to try and get me to uh, point one, I think, which is where you are when you get a hangover the next day. And then the tests yeah. I would do the next day would also show you know how effective i was yeah um, in terms of logic and reasoning and reflexes and that sort of thing yeah but i, I never made it to point one yeah uh, right. i i made it to point oh eight and the doctor who was running it said i reckon he's had enough right and i was i was just i was just not making too much sense i was very garrulous <laughs> maybe, I, maybe i was making sense but i was very garrulous and i <laughs> She just made a call and that was that was the right thing to do. So yeah. I didn't actually, and this was often a problem for me, is that I never got a hangover. So yeah. I never got I never had to deal with the consequence of a throbbing headache the next day, which I think might have actually maybe it teaches some people that the next time around I don't want that feeling again. Yeah. So therefore I won't drink as much. I never had that. And I think the reason for that was because I was a quick drunk and, yeah. and really I could be under point one and enjoying myself. And I mean when I was growing up. And driving, uh, 0.08 was the the legal alcohol limit for driving. I could yeah, I, I could technically have gotten into a car, yeah, driven home in the state I am in the documentary, and I would never have done that. I would certainly be conscious enough of my own yeah. abilities to know that I could get into it. Legally, I'd be allowed to. If I was yeah. pulled over, unless I had committed some infringement, yeah. if I was pulled over, I'd be fine. Yeah, um, which I guess is why it's been reduced to 0.05. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, that was, uh, I, I can honestly tell you, Andy, that I, I didn't think, yeah, this is for me. After I drank it again, I, I certainly yeah. didn't think yeah. <laughs> I was going to rediscover it as an old friend. Yeah. <laughs> and just finally, what do you, I guess, what do you think a healthy, good um, drinking, Australian drinking culture would look like? Well, if, oh, look, I don't think it'd be... Um, as available as it is, you know, yeah. I in terms of being able to purchase it whenever you want. Yeah. I think probably I'd like to think there'd be some algorithm you could work on because a lot of people get it delivered now. So they don't even have to, there's no humor interaction of going down to the shop and having a chat to anybody or, yeah. or perhaps, uh, you know, sometimes we might be discouraged from, well, I can't go out and go down there because I've had too many drinks. So therefore I'll, you don't end up buying any more alcohol. But now, of course, it's very easy. And people with some difficulties who are struggling with addiction and, uh, and the consequences of consuming too much alcohol, uh, sadly, um, you can anonymously connect with the supplier and, the, and it's by the door. You don't have to see anybody. And I think those who are lonely and struggling are, are in for a tougher time than maybe they would have been 10 yeah. or 15 years ago. So I'd like to see some sort of algorithm that sort of red flags excessive purchasing at least anyway or at least introduces a human element where there's a yeah. kind of there's a kind of almost like gambling in a way yeah yeah i know we're getting into nanny state areas and 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 infringements of people's personal liberties and freedoms but uh and i don't know what the solution is but i just know that that seems to be a problem an additional yeah. problem to have to cope with i don't quite know what the solution is but. yeah cool all right thank you for your time just give me a bit of when's when's the show on and when can we when, when, what's the kind of go well, it's, uh, the first episode goes to where um, 8.30 on Tuesday, the 21st of July. Yep. And it's, uh, it's the next Tuesday and the Tuesday after that as well. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, cool. Well, thank you so much for taking the time today and, uh, and uh, talking us through the show. We'll be watching it avidly. So, so thank you so much. Oh, thanks, Andy. I hope everybody enjoys it. Yeah, thank you. Cool. Okay. Cheers.